Adobe's, myself, and the department. Thank you for coming to our poster uh, session. The way that this is going to work this is different than years before. Um, every group will present. They have approximately 80 seconds, at which point my phone will start beeping. You have 10 seconds to wrap up and then move on to the next. Okay, so um, let's see. If you, the slide will indicate who's up next. If you are, are on deck, please come over here so we can move very uh, quickly. All right, so uh, without further ado, we will begin with facial expression mapping. All right. All right, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Chris. This is my team, Luke and Horatio. And we worked on facial expression mapping. And essentially, what that is, is we wanted to take video and images um, that you can take just from any conventional camera that you have. It doesn't need to be a depth camera or anything like that. And we wanted to feed it into a neural network in order to reproduce the facial expressions that you would be having in that um, video or photo. Um, how we did this, real quick, was that we just uh, used an open source library to map 68 points to the vertice. That was our input uh, to train the neural network, and then the output was the expression on the face. Uh, as you can see here, here are some of our results. These are all taken from uh, videos, but you can just do the same thing with images as well, as you can see here. Uh, and because we're short for time, thank you. You guys can check out our poster right back over there. Thanks. For my senior project, I was working on research as far as improving the uh, closed captioning ecosystem, specifically for domain-specific videos in cooking. Um, so what that means is building a sort of pipeline uh, in which I decoded uh, about one minute videos, uh, five frames per second, so five images per second of video, and I was able to extract information from these videos in three parts. Um, the first two parts are actually what is in the images and the frames of the videos. Um, the first was uh, open character recognition of text within the videos. So the specific data set of videos that I was using actually had text, really nice, clear, bold text uh, that would in, uh, indicate certain ingredients or objects or measurements that were going to be used in those videos. And then the second one was identifying objects within those frames. Uh, the first one was using a piece of software called Tesseract. Um, it's used for taking manuscripts and converting them to PDFs traditionally, but it's also really good for picking up text recognition. Um, and the second one was a TensorFlow model, an open source one called ImageNet, uh, using the a YouTube ADEM video uh, data set, which is ADEM. <laughs> so like, that's it. <laughs> All right, uh, so our project was Faces. Um, the basic premise is user inputs a video, and then it's split it into a bunch of frames, usually one every two to four seconds, and then it runs each frame through the Google Cloud Vision API, which recognizing, recognizes if there's a face in it and tells you the emotion that are most likely feeling based off the facial expressions. And then with all the frames, with all faces, uh, combined, you kind of graph the, the progression of emotion throughout the video. Um, the, the only four emotions that the Google Cloud Vision API works with is uh, happy, sad, surprise, and anger. Um, and the, Google, the Vision API is part of Google's machine learning, so the results are changed day to day. And uh, uh, yeah. And uh, probably seen the here's Johnny clip a thousand times over the semester. Um, so this is just an example, like it takes that video and puts it through a million pictures and then does each one individually, so it takes like 10 minutes sometimes. Uh, and then it outlines the face and says he's angry. That's it. Thank you. We're back in the garage. <laughs> Hi guys, I'm Anna O'Toole, this is Allison Hopkins, and we created Spot, which is an application that detects cars and other objects in the parking lot. We realized a problem on campus of parking. We wanted to um, create something to alleviate that stress. 
And our method was we used OpenCV and detection by contrast to tell if there was a car or other objects, so like a person in a spot. So we tested on images and video, but live video was what ended up giving us the best result. Uh, this is a live shot of our application. On the bottom, you can see the morphed image after we convert it to HSV, which stands for hue saturation value. And we also put erosion and dilation on the, the image. And uh, the yellow squares show the outlines of places where the spot is currently occupied. So come to our booth on the left if you want to learn more. Hi, so I'm Lauren and this is Miguel and we did a website for Villanova Intramurals. Oh, I went backwards. Nice. I just <laughs> messed it up. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, so our website was basically to uh, get rid of the entire paperwork process so you no longer have to fill out forms and take it into person and get them signed off and same with the forfeit fee and all that sort of thing. So we put everything online. We had to work with the legality of uh, e-signatures and we also had to create an algorithm that allowed for schedules to be automatically created. Yeah, so as uh, Lauren just said, we digitized the whole um, sign-up process for intramurals uh, by building a website using Facebook's React.js and JSX um, doc hub to deal with e-signatures, and then a bunch of different Google products to deal with the rest, including Sheets and AppScript, uh, which is based on JavaScript and allowed us to do that um, automatic bracket making. So come yep. check us out, and our website's up and live if you want to take a look. Yeah. <laughs> hey guys, uh, I'm John. So my project's called Translate Me, and so the goal was to detect the image in a text and then display that translated text back onto the original image. Um, so, uh, yeah, I have time. Okay, so the first, <laughs> the first process was to use OCR to detect the text and then um, train a neural net to identify the font and then just so I could display it back. So um, if you would like to see how I went from this to that without paint, I'm in that <laughs> corner over there. So hello everyone, I'm Kathleen and my project is about machine learning for cancer. I wanted to um, combine biology and computer science um, to do the project and I did math because the, I wanted to emphasize the importance of having good statistics to the success of the project. My goals were to classify uh, samples into two types, AML and AL, which are the two subtypes of leukemia. And I wanted to analyze the gene expression profiles and see if there were patterns between the two uh, subtypes of blood cancer. And I use machine learning. I use the supervised learning part to do the, the to train to train classifiers and export the best one, and use the GUI to um, input new samples that, and the result is going to tell me if they are AML or ALL. And I use unsupervised learning to to um, to visualize the data and to do uh, data mining and data analysis. And if you want to see the results, you you're going to have to go to the poster. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, I'm Sally, and this is David. And we created an iOS application in order to track the real, in real time, track the shuttle that goes around campus. And what really inspired us to create this app was um, how volatile the shuttle system is, and we wanted to bridge the communication between the driver and the student. And this is our basic UI design. This is our prototype, and we wanted to make it Uber-esque in order to um, have it very user-friendly so that both the driver and um, the student can communicate properly through the app. Uh, so the tools that we used were uh, Xcode and Swift, uh, which was all like fairly new to us. Um, we also came across Firebase, which is like a real-time database, um, which you could store like GPS coordinates in like real-time. So, um, so overall, we were able to create a basic UI, uh, such as like a login screen schedule, as well as a map that shows the user location, um, such as dropping pins and tracking the GPS coordinates. So uh, come check us out.
Hi, everyone. Uh, our team created an Android application called Odyssey. Uh, Odyssey is a location-based augmented reality game. And uh, what that means is you can create cre uh, quests in a specific location and have your friends actually go to them and see them uh, in real life and be able to walk around the models. So a lot of you guys probably know what augmented reality is and the difference between augmented reality and virtual reality is that in augmented reality, you're taking a virtual object and placing it in essentially a camera view. So you're overlaying uh, a virtual object in real space. So this is a view of a street with uh, money overlaid. This is an early view that we had of a heart kind of floating. Right, uh, so we used uh, our location services and the phone's GPS. Um, we used a, uh, a augmented reality library called Kudon, and we interacted with the uh, camera and also Amazon Web Services to create this cloud-based game that you can uh, add your friends um, and explore their quests and uh, fight monsters and pick up objects along the way. Thank you. And we're over there if anyone has any questions. So I'm Rachel. I'm Kasha. And for our project, we looked at trying to identify brand logos within images shared on social media. Yeah, so we ended up storing all of our data in Postgres. Um, we got all of it from Tweepy, so we just collected tweets with images. Uh, and this is all of the data we ended up storing. And then we generated sentiments from the text and looked at the presence of image with different models. So. And how we actually went through and classified the images. We had a couple different um, detectors that we tried training. Um, and we went through and tried to find interesting points within images. And we tried to find areas within the image that we thought would fit based on um, like different classifiers that we had trained. Um, and then we combined some of them to get an overall result so that in the database that we created, we could store if there's a positive match for the image, for the logo, or if there's no logo present. So yeah, yeah. come check us out. We're over there. Hi everyone, I'm Drew Myhall. Uh, I created Pollster, which is an anonymous polling application for Androids. Uh, my motivations were creating a simplistic polling application and to try out new technology, which, success. Um, I used Android Studio on Genymotion, which I've never used before, which is the uh, tying back to the trying new technology. And for these are my brief results. These are just some screen captures of the actual Android application I created. And if you want to see more, I am right over there next to Dan. Thank you. Hi, guys. I'm Lindley Busby, and I created a um, web dashboard for a company called Iron Point Pi Financial. And essentially, they're a um, cloud-based cloud payment company um, who is just starting out and they, they needed a dashboard where they can display all their data. Um, so essentially I just created a, a basic dashboard that would display their month to date and year to date um, totals and based on their customer and vendors. Um, and then here's a basic just screenshots of um, some of the dashboard and if you want to see more, my posters back there. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Tim. And I'm Kim. Kim. And that is messed up. Um, <laughs> so we're, we're versatile augmentation. <coughs> and our app is basically talking about, uh, try, is working with the augmented reality, sort of like what the Odyssey guys did. Uh, but we use the more traditional markers. So we're using the markers, and we're trying to create an environment where the user itself is the one who creates the system. It's not a system created for users. It's the user who creates the system themselves. Um, so yeah, the single this one app that provides a lot of versatility in setting what it does. So next. So yeah, it's not market ready, but we end up getting uh, an app ready that you can uh, choose which object goes where, and then you move the piece of paper around and you can see them move. So if you want to come see that in action, or you want to check out how we did it, we're right over there in the corner. Everybody, our group is uh, cheaper, steeper, and we created a comparative e-commerce app that uh, extracts data from a bunch of websites 
and that compares the prices all in one uh, page. And we thought it'd be really useful for the upcoming uh, holiday shopping season. Um, and we uh, we had like this other opportunity with it with business analytics. We thought we can kind of track the uh, the trends with products prices and the different retailers that they were using. Um, and that's that's it. You want to see us? Our boards over there. So I'm Zach, and these are my teammates, uh, Rob and Brendan. And the title of our project is Digital Forensics Crime Scene Investigation. So for our project, we created a uh, interactive virtual crime scene for the digital forensics course. Um, the environment is explored using the cave. And uh, ideally, groups of up to five students in the digital forensics class will be able to navigate the crime scene, analyze it, and identify the different pieces of evidence hidden throughout the environment. Uh, so the main program that we had to use is called Wizard. Um, that's where all the co code was stored. That's how we were able to manipulate all, all the objects, uh, including the inspector, which was move everything around. Uh, it also was code, the animation features to move everything around, as well as uh, configuration from bringing it to our laptop into the cave itself. So yeah, those are some examples of some of the evidence that we hid throughout the apartment. So we took the models, hid them in a 3D space, manipulated some of their textures as need be, like we did with the flash drives, we edited their colors so that they're not completely identical in the apartment. We want to try to make it as realistic as possible. And um, if you're, for all faculty members and students that haven't seen the cave yet, um, our, our presentation, we'll be leading another group very shortly following the conclusion of the rest of the presentation. So um, instead of just viewing our poster, please join us as we uh, demonstrate what we built. I'm Megan Bridge. I'm Grace Alfieri. And we made a beat heart monitoring framework. Um, so the, what this does is it takes uh, information from a Fitbit, it uh, pushes it to the Fitbit service, which it does by default, and then we pull it down to our own SQL database, where we then trend that information on a website. What this allows for is remote monitoring of someone's uh, vital statistics, uh, which obviously with their own consent, uh, we used an OAuth key to pull that information. Um, so the main difference is that you can see another person's the main difference from Fitbit is that you can see another person's information. Um, we made it so that you can pull heart rate, step count, and calories. And with this, uh, as the hardware expands, you can also expand to see uh, more statistics, such as oxygen saturation, and trend that ultimately to have maybe someone monitoring your health at all times to know if something's going wrong before you do. And based on all the data we were able to pull from the three of our Fitbits, this is these are just a few screenshots of the dashboard we created. And while heart rate was our main focus, as Brian said, we looked at um, steps and then active minutes as well as calories burned. Um, we also set up an alert system so that if it detected uh, an abnormally high heart rate, um, an alert came up on the dashboard to let you know. Come stop by yeah. our poster. <laughs> Hi everyone, so I'm Kent, and for my project I built a Hadoop cluster with Raspberry Pis. Um, so Raspberry Pis are like these credit card sized computers, and they're really cheap and they're a good way to explore distributed computing. Um, Hadoop is an open source framework for distributed storage and data processing. Um, so Hadoop is everywhere, distributed systems are everywhere, so I really wanted to see what kind of challenges were presented um, by like modern day distributed systems. So um, I started with a single node cluster, and then I manually scaled it up to three. Um, and then I had to set up some automation so I could actually um, set up 12 nodes um, with like, without manually configuring all of them. And the key challenges were like, networking of multi-node clusters, um, and then like, looking at performance bottlenecks, whether it be like, um, CPU, RAM, or the actual network itself. And then um, creating a robust automation system that would actually let me provision these servers without me having to manually configure each one. And I'm set up in the far corner over there, so check it out. Okay, I'm Carl, and this is Chris, and we create the virtual reality game VR Traffic Dodge for the Oculus. So basically, we just took the classic Frogger game and put a virtual reality spin on it, kind of brought it up to modern times. Uh, we used the Unity game engine, and we mainly uh, coded our scripts in C Sharp. Uh, we were looking to do um, something, a game that was sort of simple and achievable in the semester, 
So we brainstormed ideas, we presented them to the class, and we got really good uh, feedback on doing a frog game for virtual reality. Um, so come check us out. Our, here's um, a video of sort of like what the gameplay likes, what, what the gameplay looks like, and Maybe what it looks like. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, so come check us out in the room back there. My name is Thomas Polonsky. Uh, for my project, I decided to create an Android application uh, that could pretty much just take out all your information from the phone. Uh, you know, um, it was sort of for research purposes and sort of for my own personal use eventually. <laughs> because, as you can see, T-Mobile charged me $700 when uh, my stolen phone was used to make international phone calls, and I realized Android Device Manager wasn't enough. You know, maybe I wanted the, uh, the guy to uh, have my phone for a little bit longer so I could see what I could get off of him. Uh, as you can see, there's quite a lot of information that a person could take off a phone. So, uh, you know, I, wanna, uh, I wanted to really see, you know, how much I could, I could take. And, um, yeah, my poster is in that little room over there. All right, great. So 